Does Paul's conversion prove Christianity? Some have argued that it does. We all know Paul's story. He was a zealous Pharisee, bent on wiping out Christianity before he could get too far off the ground. While on his way to Damascus, Paul saw what he believed to be the risen Jesus. He did a complete 180 and started preaching the faith that he was once determined to destroy. This is a big deal because Jesus' followers were preaching bodily resurrection from day one. Paul considered himself to be charged directly by Jesus to preach the same message. When he later met with the apostles, they gave his gospel their stamp of approval. There is no sense in arguing that Paul was faking the funk. Everybody acknowledges he was obviously sincere. Paul talks about being knocked from pillar to post, he was beaten with rods several times, repeatedly arrested, shipwrecked, stoned, and left for dead because of his unwavering commitment to preach the gospel. We read in Paul's letters that he rejected honor for men, lived a celibate life, and worked with his own hands to fund his missionary journeys. There isn't anything about Paul that would make us think that his faith was a put on. Some skeptics have suggested that Paul had an epileptic seizure or experienced a mixture of guilt-induced PTSD and conversion disorder, but we don't get much of an impression that Paul ever felt guilty for his actions before his conversion. And from reading his letters, he certainly doesn't come across as someone who is a few fries short of a Happy Meal. He comes across as a zealous but very reasonable guy. And the seizure just seems like a totally baseless conjecture. We search in vain throughout antiquity to find any similar hallucinations that turn notorious murdering zealots into faithful martyrs. And from reading the book of Acts, we find that it isn't just any hallucination that we need to explain away Paul's experience, but a complex waking hallucination of the despised Jesus in glory rebuking him. It's also a mighty strange form of hallucination that's followed by several days of blindness. These naturalistic explanations are rather weak sauce. Now I should add that these extra details found in Acts aren't something that the majority of scholars acknowledge as historical, so this does take us beyond the minimal facts kind of approach. We would have to defend the reliability of Acts to use these extra details, which is fine by me. Now with all this in mind, I think Paul's conversion is serious evidence for the resurrection, but there are some limits to it. As resurrection skeptic Matthew Harkey notes, Paul places his experiences on par with the experiences of the other apostles, but the only depictions we have of his experience are completely different and let's face it, much less compelling than the ones we find about the apostles in the Gospels. I think Harkey is mostly on the money here when he says that Paul's experience is less compelling. Compared to the multi-sensory group appearances that happened over the course of 40 days, Paul's brief vision doesn't exactly blow us away. Now let's think about this for just a minute. According to Acts, Jesus ascended to heaven and wasn't expected to be seen bodily again until his second coming. When he does appear elsewhere after the ascension, it's always in some kind of visionary fashion, like when he appears to Stephen or Ananias or even Paul later. So even from a theological standpoint, Jesus probably didn't appear to Paul bodily. Now let's consider a few details. There's the bright light, but Paul's traveling companions don't see Jesus or understand what he said to Paul. There's also the fact that Jesus' feet never touch the ground. He never sits down and eats with Paul or invites him to touch him like we see in the Gospels. Paul's experience is rather brief and we only have a few sentences about it. It seems rather clear that he had some kind of inner subjective vision. Now, let me be clear, that doesn't mean that it wasn't veridical, but it's just not on par with what the disciples experienced in Matthew, Luke, and John, those polymodal experiences. What a counter-apologist like Harkey wants to do is make Paul's conversion the paradigm of resurrection appearances, which does indeed water things down. Harkey says that Paul is our most important witness to the resurrection because he provides the only incontestable first-hand eyewitness testimony to an appearance of the risen Jesus we have. Apologist Mike Lacona basically agrees, saying, I believe the Gospels are historically reliable sources for the resurrection of Jesus, but Paul is our best source. Why is it that Dr. Lacona says that Paul is our best source? Well, because he agrees with Harkey that Paul is incontestable, while the Gospel accounts are, well, contestable. In his big book on the resurrection, Lacona says that historians may be going beyond what the data warrants in assigning a verdict with much confidence to these questions, and Lacona is specifically referring to questions about the very physical appearances to to Thomas, the Emmaus disciples, Mary Magdalene, and so on. Now with all this in mind, I'd say that Paul's conversion is evidentially strong as part of a cumulative case for the resurrection, but probably can't overcome most skepticism all by itself. After all, someone like Harkey assigns a low probability to the resurrection and then uses Paul's experience to argue against it. So we need to be careful not to make Paul's experience the standard for all other resurrection appearances. Sorry, but we just can't do it all through Paul. So what's the resurrection apologist to do? Well, once again, we need to get tough and defend the Gospels and Acts. I'd say that if we can show that Luke really was Paul's traveling buddy, then it would be very weird to think that his understanding of the apostolic claim of resurrection would be different than Paul's. After all, Luke 
gives us a Jesus eating fish with his disciples, breaking bread, holding conversations, and appearing over a period of 40 days. And in Acts, the apostles proclaim this kind of resurrection in the face of persecution. And even in his letters, Paul admits that his experience was abnormal compared to the other disciples. If these accounts really are based on apostolic testimony, this would explain exactly what Paul meant. In my next video, I hope to show you that you can make a more robust case than the minimal facts. Contrary to what Lacona thinks, this is not going beyond what the data warrants. We can say these things with confidence, and I'll be sure to point you to some resources that will help equip you to make that case. Thanks for watching.